Uh, hi, I'm Vasco, I'm CEO of Waiter, and uh, we're developing a semantic mesh platform. And today I'm going to talk about semantic web in general and specifically applied to media. Um, and even more specifically, user generated content. But I, I, I didn't know what was the level of the audience, so I just wanted to gauge how familiar are you with this semantic web? Is this a new concept for you? you develop stuff in it? Uh, anybody familiar with semantic web? I'll volunteer a suggestion. I mean, I understand a little bit about the concept of, that there is tagging and people are doing tagging, um, but like how it really applies and you know works and what the opportunities and so forth about it. I, I only know little smatterings, and I'd like to understand about it. So I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of background. Of what is this semantic? What's the goal? Of, what's the whole point of this? So uh, the idea of the semantic web is basically uh, extending the current web, <laughs> extending the current web in a way that we can not just have raw data, but, but have basically computers understand what the data is. Um, so that basically computers can work smarter and work in cooperation with people in a better way. Uh, and this was sort of the definition of Team Berners-Lee, which is also credited for a big chunk of creating the idea of the semantic web. Um, so what we want basically is to increase the utility of information by connecting the definition of the information to the content. So uh, when you put caller, it's not just you know the word caller, but an actual concept that has properties that you know uh, that is associated with certain things, but other things are not. And, and there's different types of caller, etc. And so in this case, the idea of this menu web is that you have something that actually points to a specific definition of what caller is. In this case, it's a long example. So this immediately brings the problem, which is well, who who decides what the definition, where the definition what are the resources, right? And this is something we'll talk a little about uh, later on. Um, and in the beginning, it was just an idea of a few people, and it eventually became uh, this uh, W3C sort of, uh, it, it took it on and decided to that it would be a, a worthwhile effort, and it's been growing since then. And, and the basic languages of the semantic web are RDF, RDF, Schema, and OWL. There are many others, but these are the ones that seem to have a little more support in it than most of any other. Um, so why do we need the semantic web? I mean, the web works pretty well right now, so what, what's the point? Well, uh, right now, I mean, there's a lot of information overload, and, and you know, as you've seen, seen by big commercials, you know, many things, uh, the same work can be many things, the same concepts can be present in different spaces, but those spaces are not really connected because, you know, we don't understand automatically what those concepts are. So the idea of the semantic web is really to address a little bit of the information Overload. So right now we have difficulties to find, present, access, or maintain available information, uh, the information on the web. And so what we want is basically a, a data representation uh, that allows computers to do, to understand information on the that, That's sort of the general idea of the semantic web. And of course, when you say this idea, everybody says, yeah, that makes sense. You know, like, I think that that's good. The problem is when you actually try to execute it, everybody thinks they should be doing it in a slightly different way. So, what we had in 1994, when the sort of the web really started taking off, is you had this basically HTML, uh, you had this file level, and you had like text. And this was string, basically. Um, what we want to have, and this is sort of what we're starting to be, is you know not only XML, which is sort of old, but you have this idea of RDF and OWL that allows you to connect, to understand you know, that this person is within this organization, even, if, even though they might be in different documents, because you've identified it the same resource in different spaces, and that you know this person actually uh, there's this news about this particular person and this other news about this particular company, and even though no one specifically went and made this connection because they they annotated in the way the computers can understand what these concepts are, those concepts are connected automatically. So if you think about news, for example, you know. For us, humans, it's very easy to, when you read an article about Barack Obama, to understand, oh, yeah, Barack Obama is president, and everything that is associated with it. But if you want a computer to understand that you want to use just about that particular person, uh, you need to have a way to, for the computer to understand what, what is that person and how do you define it. And that, that's sort of where we're, we're starting to be right now. Um, and there's a project called the Link Day, which is fairly recent. And this is, I, I, I'll, I'll try and sort of in that resources that I think are interesting for anybody that wants to do anything in space. One of them is link data. This gives you a picture of all the 
sources of information that are interconnected in a semantic way right now. So when this started, there was only a few. And this is actually live view. I, I, this is a screenshot, but actually if you click on any of these um, little bubbles here, you'd actually go to the website of uh, the actual resource, and you'd be able to query it in a semantic way. So there's uh, the same way that you can query information from databases using you know, MySQL and other type of languages. You have semantic query languages like Sparkle and no one really has defined the one that everybody's going to use, but there's a few of them that people generally use. And so what this gives you, what this gives you is a set of information. So for example, uh, the same way that you have Wikipedia that combines a lot of information that is created by users, you have sort of the semantic version of that called Wikipedia, where um, the concepts are identified by their categories and they're connected by, you know, if this is a person, then where does this person work? Oh, in this company, because this thing is actually a company. And, and you can go and access that information, and, and then the idea is that if things are connected, then you know if you issue a much more complex query, you can answer it by traveling, traversing these connections. Right? Um, so, sorry. So this brings us the problem of, of coverage, right? Because if you think about it, if you want to assign uh, categories and types to everything that exists, you need to know everything about everything, which is sort of an unattainable goal. Uh, so, at some point, people said, oh. Uh, and this were some of the original approaches. Oh, it's easy. We'll sit down and we'll just write everything we know about everything, and that'll be it. And you know, we're, we're done. But very quickly, you realize that nobody knows everything about everything. That's the first thing. And the other thing is that what you and I know is really different. Even the things that we think are in common are really different. Our definitions, the way we look at the world, the way we see property, and and that became really apparent when you try to accumulate large amounts of information. Large amounts of amount of semantic information. You start having a lot of collisions. People say, "Oh, wait, but that's not how we define, you know, cardinal numbers." I mean, for me, it's slightly different. Or, you know, politics should include this other area that you don't think it should include. Um, and so, the idea of having this one massive thing just fell apart very quickly. And 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 now we're going more into the idea of distributed, right? So you have all these topics. You need to have some coverage for all the topics, but that coverage really should be done by the people that understand those critical topics. So. You know, it, like for example, you know, let's pick one here, the gene ontology, right? I mean, the gene ontology is done by people that understand genes, and that's what they describe. I mean, this is what we think genes, and even then there's obviously some uh, differences between the people that study genes, but they certainly understand much more about genes than the people that do, I don't know, uh, pick a different one here, like this is a music website, like geography names or things like that. So. The idea of coverage is that you know you need to have these resources, and in about 1990, we had a few of those resources that were created mostly by government, but there they were very few. And in 2003, you started having a few thousand, but they were still very scattered. They were not really connected. They were just you know someone sat down one day and wrote a file about you know their what's in their garage, kind of thing. and it's like oh here it is. Uh, but in 2011, as we marched towards it, we're somewhere in between here. 2011, the idea that you have Millions, right? So that the idea is that if you have a blog and your blog talks about cars, you're going to have some sort of small ontologies, what, what you call them, resources uh, that describes what's important to you in your blog in a semantic way, right? And so each person that has a blog or, or a newspaper or a user generated from the website of any kind or any website really has one of these, then you have you know millions, potentially billions of these resources. So you have like the space of things, and these are a few of the ones that. Uh, are available right now for people to use. So Freebase, Sumo, they're all ontologies. A lot of these are sort of high level stuff. So uh, they're, they're useful, especially if you want to develop stuff in this area. But for end users, uh, Freebase is the most useful right now. And it's not a of Freebase, but it's, uh, it's this, again, this idea of Wikipedia, but uh, where everybody contributes semantic information to one, well, technically a set of large semantic databases, but you access it sort of transparently. Um, so once you have this this uh, this, this resources, this uh, availability of information, then you could do interesting things with it. This is a sample of an application that was done at MIT. It's called the Simulant, and it was like you would search for things, and it would give you uh, you know things that were related semantically, and you could navigate. You know, in this case, you'd have you know um, you could go by subject and say, okay, I want stuff in, in advertising, and you'd know who works in advertising, and so you could navigate based on the concepts of people and organizations that were there. And so here, the architecture of this idea is that it supports this integration 
of different data sources, and, uh, and you have the continuity that can expose it directly in RDF. Um, so the actual semantic stack, please let me know if I'm getting too technical about this. You know, I, I want to have it right. <laughs> but uh, so the, the actual stack of, of the content in, 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 in the, the semantic web, the idea is that you have um, basically, you had XML before, it's already existed before they did the semantic web, describing documents using some sort of uh, you know, human readable format. And then on top of it, you have REF, you have the vocabulary of apologies. And then we're sort of at this stage right now, where we can we have a set of apologies, we can use them to do interesting stuff. But now the next thing is this logic proof and trust. And this logic is to be able to have really deductive power on top of just the, top of the apological information. So, the ontological information will tell you how things are related, what are the categories, you know, like uh, a human is, uh, is an animal, and it's a living thing, and it has these sort of properties. But there are no real easy ways of deducing that, oh, if I'm a human and I live in one country, then, you know, I probably don't live anywhere else. This is my home address. Or, you know, if I have this key, if I have this, if I have children, then they have me as a parent because, you know, it works both ways. So, Things that for us are very straightforward, that's the next thing we have to do is, is, is embedding logic. And of course, logic has been studied by you know, probably thousands of years now, uh, but still we have to be able to do it on a very large scale as we need to. And then and then proving this that the logic is sound. And then finally is this idea of trust. Because the problem is that, you know, as anything else in the web, anybody can say anything about anything. Right? So technically you could invent your own world or the laws of physics don't exist, and then submit an apology about that, and then crash the entire web if there was no idea of trust. So the idea is that you have to be able to know how, who to trust, and who are the experts in certain things, and how you distinguish about things that are, you know, uh, trustworthy or more things that aren't. Uh, it's a little bit like what's been happening in news and, and, and blogs in general. I mean, once everybody has access to providing information in the form of news, then how do you know who to trust, uh, and how do you verify sources? The same, the same thing happens here. Um, so I want to talk a little about REF because it's, uh, it's sort of the fun, one of the fundamental languages in, in the web. And, uh, and you probably will hear about it or see things referred to it in the future as semantic web progresses. Um, so the idea of REF is, is resource description framework. It stands for, REF stands for that. And, um, and it's basically a framework for describing the data and in a way that can be interchanged, that can be communicated um, between machines. Uh, and the idea of this language is that it, you, you'll have better precision in discovering the resources that you that you want to set full text because things are written in way. Uh, and, um, and basically, uh, you have applications that, that, so this language will assist applications as the scheme is for this, for this language evolved. Um, and, uh, and you have interoperability of different data, even if it's different languages, even if it's different countries, different sources, data is this common way of communicating this type of information. Um, and uh, the main concepts are, well, you have a resource. So basically, a resource is anything that can be named by uh, uh, URI. So this is like a, a, a resource. It's a universal resource identifier. It's like in, in, in the web case, it's a URL. So Anything that you point to, they can you know, point a link to and say, this is what I'm talking about. This concept I'm defined here, you know, caller, car, uh, Mazda, uh, you know, pod camp. Can an action and not just an index moment in an action be kind of a yes. identifier? Anything, right? I mean, you could think pod camp, you could think the person that go in pod camp, the, the act of attending pod camp had a the net presenting in PodCamp, and all of these are connected. Right? So, for attending PodCamp involves you being related with PodCamp in some way, and with the people that are presenting, and with being there physically, and you know all sorts of problems. So, anything you can think of that can be named is 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 you know is a resource because it's it's a it's a you basically uh, describe things about resources. So, if you can't name it. Then you can reason about it. That's, that's sort of the idea, even if it's an abstract concept. And, and, and we do that in language all the time. I mean, you know, if you're publishing a blog or doing a video, you talk about abstract stuff all the time. Most of the time, without even realizing it. Um, then we have properties. So, um, so it's the thing that we're going to describe about this resource, right? Uh, and then we have a statement. 
So uh, the statement is a combination. So for example, in this case, we have Alice is the creator of this resource, right? And this is Alice's own page. But you have, uh, uh, and I have an example here. So the resource, uh, uh, there's person, this value Alice, a name, uh, and this in, in turn should be connected in a different state, which should be connected to what does this mean, right? I mean, it's, which person is this? This entity here was the creator of this resource, which is a web page, their own, own personal web page. So and it's very trivial. I mean, if you have, like, again, like you have a blog, the creator of the blog is a certain person, so you have a statement like this, you know, embedded. And this, um, I actually have an example here. This is a little like HTML in the sense that this would be the source code, source code of the page, right? You have your HTML and you have this uh, basically indicating that uh, the statement that we just said. Now the problem, one of the problems that people are trying to address is that everything that comes here before, all this thing, this is called the namespace. So it, it tells which domain you're talking about. So if you specify it, if you specify it, then you're going to be able to say, well, every time I talk about this X, this shortcut here, um, like for example, let's say this one, right? So you have this domain. This domain is HTTP, CGL, and the NAU people. So every time you say TGL staff, you're talking about all this staff, right? And this is made as a an easy process of then describing stuff. But still, we go back to the issue that there's many, many domains, right? And you can have the same person being described as a domain. So, for example, if I go to TNU, I can have a domain at TNU that identifies me. But if I work at Guaido also, then you know, Guaido is going to identify me. And, and then you, and that's something that people are trying to, to uh, resolve is how do you create this universal space? Right? How do you say, well, no, no, this is the definite identifier for car. And everybody that talks about car, as long as it's the same concept, should refer to here. And this is something that is sort of organic, right? I mean, uh, you know, my belief is that eventually there's, there's people creating all these resources and people aggregating resources and people creating tools to work on these resources. And eventually everybody's going to start to, it's a little like Facebook and the social network, right? It's, there's a lot of them and at some point you just get critical mass enough that people in general are there and start using that. <laughs> um, so why is this better than XML if you use XML for something? Well, um, the you can model this in different ways, but the information would be the same. So in XML, depending on how you model the information, the way you will infer different things from it. But the idea with the RDF is that it's sort of the representation of the real thing. So you could say it in different ways, but theoretically you should infer the same things about it because you're, you're saying the same thing. So, um, oh, this is sort of, okay. but, uh, um, so the idea is that a certain RDF model enables any general purpose application to refer the same structure uh, from the, 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 the information in the graph. So even though you're seeing lines here, most times, because the, we're always talking about this connected graph, how things are connected, we always see things as graphs. You know, like the nodes of the graph are concepts, and the edges are sort of information about those concepts. And so. We always talk about traversing the graph, and we always, you know, for us, I look at this and I see, oh, look, there's a graph, and see, there's this actually points to Alice, the creator. So, you know, I can see this as a node, and this is an edge, and this is another node, and there's a connection between them. And um, so, you might see a lot of times like information in the graph or things in the graph. Well, this is, this is what I should talk about. Um, so, the other language that you're going to see, sort of a step up from RDF, is OWL. So. OWL is an ontology web language, um, and most of the time, and it's sort of divided into three sub-languages, OWL Lite, OWL Lite, uh, OWL DL, which is description of logic, and FOOL. FOOL, uh, the problem with FOOL is that its competition is trackable a lot of the times because it's, um, it's, it leads to cycles and to a bunch of other information that we don't, we can't really handle on large scale right now. So most people are using either OWL Lite or OWL DL. And the idea here is that, uh, so ARIA, if, if, you, if you notice, you can describe stuff, but you can't say, like, Alice is not an animal, or Alice is not a chair. So the idea is having negativity or saying, oh, uh, transitivity. You find properties about properties. You can't really do that easily with RDF. So OWL sort of brings 
you know, that next layer, which is RDF describes how things are connected at the basic level, and then with all you can say, well, it's not going to give you the other properties that allow me to reason about all this. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so you can express equivalence, the identity, difference, inverse, transitivity, things like that. There are still things that all of them do, and um, Dam, Dam of oil was created by the U.S. government a while back, so it tries to address that. But then, see, the, the problem is, once you get to this thing, you end up becoming, creating so many languages that you force people to split, and you, you know, only people that are completely uh, paranoid about this can really understand all these little things, and so it doesn't translate well to the end user. And so, this was a state, really, of, you know, it was more academic until a few years back. And uh, in the meantime, what happened was that, um, this is sort of a separation of, depending on how you measure it, uh, rich media, video, and images. So a lot of what comprises the uh, user generated content. Uh, so this is most of what we care right now is weighted. So it's the part of user generated content that has tags associated with it and doesn't have a lot of other text. So uh, blogs are definitely user generated content, but, uh, but there's a lot of text in it, obviously. And they represent, depending on how you measure, about 45% of all online content this time. And what's happened is, well, until a few years back, all this discussion about the semantic web was really mostly academic. I mean, people saw the utility of it in the long term, but no one could really agree on how to achieve this vision. And so it was, no one could come up, for example, with a killer app, and no one has come up with it yet. Something that could tell people right away, oh, I get it, this is why we need this. This is like goes beyond anything else that I've seen and really gives me the value for what I want to use. But slowly it's becoming more apparent that you need to have something like that because of user generated content. So, uh, user generated content, this is probably, you know this, I mean, you have images, videos, blogs, and, and there's many other types of user generated content, or mix, or mashups, or whatever you want. And all of this, basically, all these websites, one thing that is common is that they use tags. And so, for us, uh, I mean, millions of people tag uh, content online, a lot of people do it on a daily basis, they're becoming more prevalent. Even uh, recently, we've been uh, analyzing tags on actually, I just noticed that, we, that there's Glib TV here, and we have been doing a lot of stuff with uh, with content on Glib TV and uh, realizing that one of the things we're looking at is that they have data from 2005 to now, and you can see how tags are evolving. The percentage of things that are tagged is really substantially increased since then. So people are using more and more, not only that, but they're putting more tags at the time. They're really uh, becoming sort of a, a day-to-day -day event in people's lives and they're accepting it. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry. So the thing with tags for us is that um, tags sort of provide a good entry point to this resource that I was talking about. So uh, the idea of tags originally was basically a way for people to find stuff that they had tagged before, right? But uh, the problem is, uh, if I tag things with New York, NYC, or, you know, lower caps altogether New York, that makes sense to me. But how can other programs or other people or other um, websites understand that data if I use whatever I want, right? So at the time when I tagged something, the, the idea was, well, I was thinking of something. If I tagged something with New York, I wasn't thinking of the word New York. I was thinking of the concept of the city, right? There's something related to the city, and that's why I tagged that concept with New York. But Everything that was reported was really the string that I used. And so there's this loss of information there. And so what happens is, with current processes, with pre-semantic processes, what you have is an index on a query. So uh, search engines and, and, and other uh, types of software, they look basically at the strings. And if the strings don't match, then as far as you're concerned, it's a different thing. So if you have New York or NYC, they're really different things, unless you have this, the next step, which is the idea of semantics. So, in order to do that, um, uh, so now there's services that start to look at uh, categorizing text, for example, right? So uh, you can think of the same thing in a blog, right? A lot of people do put tag in blogs. Some people they don't, but there are services now that try to provide the text for you and try to suggest stuff that you could tag your content with. And that's the first step. The next step is going to be taking those tags and understanding what, what concepts really those tags represent and understanding how those things are connected, right? So turning all those tags into semantic tags. Because only then you can really achieve this connectedness and this understanding of what the quantity is at an automatic level. 
things that are apparent to us are very easy for humans, but right now are very hard to do for computers. So uh, the, the first thing I want to show is Freebase. So this is more as a base resource that if you want to develop stuff, uh, it's meant. if we have more on a programming side, you definitely want to use. So this is, you can use this as a as a database, so as a, like I said, we, as a semantic Wikipedia. Right now it's actually bigger than Wikipedia, you know, because it scrapes everything from Wikipedia, because it scrapes a lot of things from other sources and a lot of people contribute. And, and you can create, they, this is all free, and you can uh, create and host your own your own free base. So, you know, you could say, well, I'm going to describe my blog, for example. So, I'm going to create this little uh, you know, ontology about how things are related to the stuff that I care about. And you store the information there. And you can, you know, store it, access it, query, et cetera. And then everybody else can benefit from that. That's sort of the idea. And the data is freely available. You can consult it. But the most important thing, so this, actually, the website Freebase is actually the first client of the data itself. Right? That's the way to describe it. And they provide a really good API. If you want to use it, that's a great resource to start. They have a lot of information. And they have very, very easy and straightforward um, APIs. Actually, uh, there is a, a, new, um, a new tool that they just released, which is Anchor. Yeah, it's Anchor and Freebase. And it's, it's a little bit like uh, Google's uh, web hosting. So you know, it's like Google Web Apps, where you can create your own app at Google and post it there. They the same with Freebase. So you can create your whole app. And I, mean, I, I thought of showing the, like you can do it in five minutes, create an app that, you know, for example, uh, let's say you want to find, uh, you want to create a website that shows you the news for the top three companies in a particular, uh, in a particular domain. And it doesn't matter the domain, right? So uh, the, way they, the way you can do it very easily is, well, Freebase suggests stuff, and you can say, well, I want to only, I'm talking about companies, so someone would put like a certain area of the company, like say automotive, and Freebase knows what's the top, the top three companies in that area, right? So based on those companies, you could then search Google News, for example, for news regarding those companies. You could search, you know, other services on the web that provide different information. And all this dynamic and automatically, right? Without having to specifically create a page for, uh, for all the companies, right? Um, so Freebase is a great, great, great resource. And then on top of that, you can have uh, Zamanda, for example, is a company that came up with the idea of semantic blogging. Um, so what they do is, as you, you know, it's a widget that you install, and as you type, they suggest stuff that is related to what you're typing. Not only stuff uh, that is related to, to the tags that you want, you know, not only the tags that you should put in your blog post, but also things that are related to that. Uh, and that's sort of one of the first applications and user applications of this idea of semantic web for blogging, and it's been very successful. Um, uh, Open Calais is uh, interesting because this is actually an old version of it. They, they're since then doing the different things. They're also another of those backbone infrastructure kind of services on the web, and they're getting bigger and bigger. And their idea is basically you send a text, they tell you stuff that is in the text, right? So they identify names, they identify the people, the companies, the places, the Actions, uh, whatever, and then they mark it up semantically. Right? So, and, and it's mostly free. All of this is mostly free. Uh, it's free up to a certain number of requests per day, which is enough for, unless you're making a lot of money out of it, you use it for free. That's the idea. And it's there's all of this also has APIs. So, you, if you want to develop something, and if you if you think, well, how do I actually get the information for this? You can just use this kind of service to send. Um, the same thing is going to happen with Waiter, right? So, one of the things we're going to release is this idea of well, you know, people tag stuff in my website. Let's say I have a web image website. People tag stuff in it. Um, I would like to have, you know, better tags, right? So cleaner tags, tags that are sort of normalized. So if people say NYC or New York City or New York, I want this to be one thing. And, and better yet, I'd like to categorize it and then, you know, do the lead to the semantic thing. Our services provide that tag. So that's one of the first things we're going to release, hopefully, in a month, uh, is this ability you can just send your tag, we'll return clean. Uh, ready to use best tag possible, extend and categorize uh, using semantic technology. Uh, but we don't have a screenshot of it yet, so I just put it here. <laughs> and, and then there's a bunch of other applications on the semantic space, right? So uh, Twine, uh, the idea here is semantic bookmark. So people create their twines, and then they can share the twine, and you can you know find someone else's twine and add to that. And, and, and all of this is not just, oh, here's my links, but here is, you know, my links within a certain domain or topic that I'm interested in, why, and all this is really semantic. 
Tier 39 is a different area than doing semantic advertising, which is really the end goal of Quayda is, is sort of, the, or at least one of the initial end goals of Quayda is this idea of doing semantic advertising, so doing smarter advertising. They're one of the pioneers in this area, and uh, and they're doing quite well. And then Bing, I mean, people have been uh, uh, hearing a lot about Bing probably lately on the TV and such, but Bing, so it's part of Microsoft. Microsoft created, uh, purchased this other company called PowerSense. And PowerSense really was the first company that took this whole idea of semantic analysis to a, a bigger level. Some, some other companies tried, but they did it better. So they were acquired by Microsoft. And Microsoft used their technology to create part of Bing. So a lot of the features that you see in Bing come from the semantic analysis that's provided by PowerSet, and they're heavily invested in it. So um, Google will not use semantic Google is starting to catch up. So the general philosophy at Google is uh, just get a lot of data and let statistics do the rest. Right? So the problem is that anything semantics if it involves handcrafted knowledge at some point because you need to sort of resources, goes a little bit against Google's philosophy, or it did. And now I think things are changing. So there was a little bit of, um, uh, how do you say that? Uh, it's not animosity, but it, uh, people really didn't want to embrace the idea of semantic resistance. Like a resistance to it? A little bit of resistance, yeah. A little bit of resistance. Uh, and uh, and the idea was, well, we really need that. I mean, if we haven't, if we just have enough data, if we just you know uh, scrape enough websites, we'll be able to get to the same conclusions by using sort of simple method. And uh, what people are realizing is that one is much less efficient because if we already know certain information, if we already know that a car has a certain number of parts and which parts those things are, and you know that uh, how things are related to the world. Why should we reinvent the wheel? I mean, why should we use this knowledge that we have decided to optimize things, right? So, as with everything, until things actually make it to the end user, the purists is always win the game, right? You always have people that are like, no, oh, it should be all semantics, or it should be all logic, or it should be all statistics. And then, as most scenarios, when it comes down to real applications, it's a hybrid kind of scenario, right? Where you have things that use a little bit of this, a little bit of that, so they can take the process, whatever works. And, uh, and, and Google had, really had no choice now than to catch up. And the weird thing is that Google is big enough to, they always had a bunch of projects in semantics, but those projects were always a little bit outliers, a little bit marginal, right? So they weren't really taken serious and given the resources they needed, and now they are being given the resources. So I, I'm expecting to see a lot of semantic stuff out of Google, and they have actually announced that they're, they're going to move into that space. Well, and Microsoft would have the advantage that all of the desktop applications could potentially have all the file, you know, they could include you know, you, you, in, in your file properties as a bunch of information in yeah. form. Um, so, yeah. And actually, right now, you can tag stuff in your computer. I mean, with it, you can tag anything in your computer. So the infrastructure is there, so they could really, really benefit. The, I think for me, one of the big questions is going to be if we're going to move into a web OS or not, right? Uh, if we're moving to, because if we're not moving to WebOS, it's still harder because there's just so many different people that have to adopt this kind of technology. Well, if you have a WebOS, it's very easy to centralize and say, okay, from now on, we're going to take all this information and you know create processes that sort of extract the semantics out of it automatically, right? Without having to have each person install whatever or have an update or you know because this thing always takes points and a lot of time to go off. Uh, and I think that. It seems to me that by, for the most part we are eventually going to web OS, right? I, mean, I don't see why not. It just a lot of the stuff we do right now is already online. I don't know about you, but a lot of the services I use are online. I mean, if I have a computer that does not have internet connection, it's sort of useless for me, right? Your email, your calendar, your I mean, your information, everything is online already, and there's more and more of it, right? I mean, your video, you know, I don't know if you use Hulu or you know, all of that. So there's really no reason except unless you really want to keep it to store it in the computer. You know, the only things that we really store in our computers probably are our digital photos if we upload them or our own videos. And even though you can upload somewhere. Right? So there's still a lot of resistance to having this this whole idea of well what if the cluster fails, right? This whole idea of the cloud, of moving into the cloud, and then it becomes a sort of abstract kind of thing that I don't really know where my stuff is, it's sort of somewhere out there. And people are still kind of having a hard time grasping that and sort of embracing it. But it's so much more efficient in, from a lot of standpoints, right? Uh, from a lot of uh, uh, different uh, points of view that 
I find it hard to believe that that's not going to happen just because even from a development standpoint, it's so much easier to do something in the cloud where you can just update stuff without having to roll out. You know, so for example, you can even see with the iPhone, right? You have an iPhone app. A lot of people download it for the first time. And then a very, very small percentage of people actually download updates for that app. Right? So you, you create it, like special games. You create a new version and you want people to, to you know, get their new version because it has enhanced whatever, right? And most of them usually enhance advertising for you. But then people, you know, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but then people don't do it. They're like, ah, it's good enough for me. Right? So it's, there's this, this hard part of making, well, and then if things crash, you have to support all this sort of, all this set of OSs, and I mean, the, the what's the name, the, the big four, the, the, Matt, Josh, the, you know, that guy, so, uh, <coughs> what's the name of the product? Uh, no, 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 what, the big, it's, uh, oh, big four. No, it's not big four, it's, uh, Something happens, 
a lot of times you don't even see that it happened because you didn't refresh. The same thing happens with the way we think. I think this is something we probably apply to a lot of different processes. So one of it is is uh, the way we, we, what we expect the other person to be able to say. So we try to predict as much as possible. And so you, you immediately try to narrow of what you think is going to come out of it. And then when something else comes out that is expected, you know, sort of forces you to be like, oh. And, then we, and, and also we are really able to adapt very easily to unexpected situations, which is another thing that we have a hard time doing in, in computational terms right now. Um, so the other is lack of normalization, right? For us, we have all of this represents the same thing, uh, but for computers, this you know this is a straightforward example. But I could say you know Big Apple things that don't even have the same letters, things that are only used to refer to New York amongst a small group of friends. So you know the place, and everybody knows that we're talking about the same place. You know home or exactly right. So that is very hard to to be able to to, um, to normalize uh, because normalization depends on context. And context depends on all these factors. And coverage. I mean, there's just a lot of different topics. I mean, the idea of knowing everything about everything is still an attainable, especially in one place where we can deal with it. And we know we can deal with it because we know that we, each human, also doesn't know everything about everything. And yet, we can navigate the world and, and reason. So we know that that's not necessary. But, uh, but uh, to have a general system that can deal with any human, that system needs to have enough information to deal with you know, a large number of topics. And that's one of the tricky parts, right? So all this integration of different sources, integration of different ontology, how do you apply it, how do you reason with this, uh, even from a computational term, I mean, this stuff, most of the times, they don't all fit in one computer, so you have to have it distributed. And then uh, how do you deal with handle all these transactions distributed? There's a lot, of, a lot of actual issues that need to be solved. So, do you see these challenges being met? I mean, it seems like an extremely tall order. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, We've come a long way I, since 94. Exactly. Uh, that, that, for me, that's why I point the most. Uh, mm -hmm. When I think about it, I mean, it's a little bit that whole idea of like every, you know, every time I know something, I know a thousand things that I don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. So I always know there's always more to do than there's none, but we have come a long way to do. So I think the game here. Is not so much getting to the perfect ending to a you know, all-knowing Big Brother kind of system, but it's just getting to the point where we get usable things, you know, things that make our life easier, that connect information, information better, that just uh, that we can benefit from, right? And just taking one step at a time. How is this being? Is, is this being used? I guess uh, with something like the uh, federal government's uh, markup of yeah. all this information. Um, I know that the data, of the, of certainly as far as we are concerned here, the federal government's the lead on doing anything like that. That's right. We're locally and, and statewide way we're behind. How much are they using on the semantic in addition to just doing their XML markup? Well, they're doing it more and more. So the government has been, from the start, the biggest supporter of this because. They have a very, a very uh, vested interest in having information properly cataloged and, and, and marked, right? And uh, we were having this conversation the other day where it's like, well, actually for commercial terms, a lot of time, accuracy doesn't need to be perfect. You know, if you want to categorize something for advertising, well, does it make a difference if you say, you know, that it's football instead of the Pittsburgh Steelers football? Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. There's there's this sort of a law of diminishing returns, you know. So at some point it's like, well, it's good enough. You know, a lot of times you do it good enough. But for the government, a lot of times it's not, right? I mean, if the government wants to, for example, the problem that I was uh, confronted with, uh, I, I did the, some work for uh, the DIA while at TNU, and the issue that they had was um, they had, you know, field operatives sending in reports, hundreds of reports every day, and they had this, you know, analysts back in Washington having to analyze all this data and it was just impossible, right? So and not only that, but the data that they wanted to connect connected over a span of time. So it was like they had to find the one report that said everything. They, they wanted to just they needed to put the pieces of the puzzle of, you know uh, on a timeline and understand that well when all of these events have happened then I need to pay attention. Right. And this was a big issue because you know obviously at the time this was after September eleventh and was whole 
from the terror attacks and so on. A lot of the money was invested in that. And, and that's when the government realized that, well, for example, I need to know if I'm talking about you know, Abu Sharif, which one I'm talking about. You know, if I'm talking a particular city or a particular instance, company, person, I need to know exactly what I'm talking about. And I need to have all the information connected to that person, not just search for Abu Sharif and get like 500,000 documents. No, track this person you know, everything that's connected to it in an automatic way. So they're doing it more and more. I think the problem is that even though the government is great at supporting this, they're also very bureaucratic. So usually, you know, it's a lot of things that like every software they develop takes a long time, there's a lot of documentation, there's a lot of, you know, so so it, it ends up taking longer to actually use than it, and, and people have always inertia to using new technologies. People that have worked in government for 20 years usually have more inertia than people that are coming in. You know, there's all this human factors to it. The web, though, especially commercially, is much more flexible and agile, right? So once something becomes useful for people in general, people are going to use it. You know, there's going to be a small number and then it's going to spread. And I mean, and we've seen that over and over, right? I mean, Twitter, Facebook, blogging, I mean, people pick up the technology, they see, well, I think, yeah, this makes sense to me. I have no problem with it, you know? Uh, Gmail, for example, in the beginning was like, oh, well, we're going to sell our privacy for advertising and what if. Pretty soon people were like, ah, whatever, you know, put the ads you want, you know, for free, that sounds good. So there's many more ways to incentivize people in the web to just adopt technologies very easily. And so what's happening now in the last three or four years is that there's been a lot of investment in companies that are doing semantic web stuff. And this is a good sign because it means that, one, they're having some adoption, there is really the interest of doing this in a commercial level, there's the provision that there's benefit, there's, so, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, so, you know, the idea of submitting web provides clear advantages. Uh, the problem is that it requires a change in behavior from users. So, if, when you're doing your blog, you want to write, I mean, you don't want to spend another 10 minutes figuring out what are exactly the concepts that you have described and is it really this one or this other that is similar, right? I mean, this is something that we don't want to do. So the idea is that the services, uh, service-oriented architecture, uh, so a lot of companies are coming, in, coming up with web services that allow the creation of applications that then alleviate this problem, right? So Zamanda was one of the examples, uh, free base price of concrete information. We're trying to do things that uh, address some of these issues. And when, once we do, then, you know, if you don't have to change your behavior, if you can just type, and as you type, automatically information is connected and aggregated for you, then people say, yeah, that sounds good. You know, the, 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 the cost-benefit analysis becomes more interesting than the user. Well, I think if you're, um, if you're someone who's trying to write, you know, to be found by search engine, you start, you see how the way you word the thing has catered it to being found in what people you say for it. Exactly. And there's actually a, an effort going on called Common Tag that is a, sort of a consortium of a few of these companies that are trying to create exactly tools so that when you tag, the tags come out in a format that is in a semantic like RDF format so that you then you tag text but it comes out as the, the thing that you really want, which is the concept you're looking for. Yet, we're, you know, people are still, the detractors of semantic websites will say, well, where do you put our application? You know, I mean, with social networking, you can point to it, right? And with any of these technologies, you can say, look at this, this changed the life of you know, millions of people. We haven't found the one that you can clearly point to in the semantic web and say, yeah, this is Jeff here, uh, are you familiar with the Mattress Factory? It's an installation art yeah. gallery on the north side. Yeah. Jeff works for them. If you were to tag the installations there based on the media use app context, the experience, the performance, and it, to really show people how the things in their life are interconnected and also as to do it in a way that it's, you know, having people coming to, you know, experiencing the thing and making them uh, contribute to it and show, like, show the challenges where there are ambiguities, where there are different domains relative to the person searching for it. Let me mention that. <laughs> <laughs> are you already involved in the starting that? Great. Very good. So, one of the things that I see, though, is that there's, you talk about what the ambiguity and people can figure out, and et cetera, but uh, there is a, a large problem semantics in interpersonal communication, uh, a large problem of misunderstanding. 
it's true that that happens. And so if you're trying to um, automatically or, or machine interpret what people are saying when there are not, there isn't a clarity in what they're saying, in the old saying, uh, what is it, you go garbage in, garbage out? Yeah, that's true. And that happens amongst people anyway, right? And you can see that if you talk to someone face to face versus the phone versus messaging versus email, it's completely different, right? I mean, things are much more easily misinterpreted through email or through messaging. I mean, that's why the whole smile oh, is art, right? It's right. the need to, to, to have a way to interpret emotions, right? Because, but, but because I think part of it is that emotions and everything else sets the context, right? I think a, 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 a big part of not understanding is not have not being in the same context, of somehow being misaligned in some of the ways that the other person is saying, so you, you interpret it the wrong way. And, and this is true, and, and I think it, it's going to be a problem, uh, I mean, it is already a problem, and it's going to be a problem that hopefully will be diminishing as you get better, right? So before, uh, the first efforts were really on, let's just make sure we can identify stuff, right? And now we're going to realize, well, let's make sure we identify stuff in context. So context is becoming more and more important, and I think as we find more ways of, of understanding that context, Understanding that you know you're coming from a certain IP, so you have a certain you're in a certain location, so you probably are subjected to a different context than someone that is accessing the website from Africa, and, and understanding how that context influences the message that you're trying to send. Uh, that's when I think those misunderstandings are going to be getting better. Now I do think that you know I mean we still have all the world. Uh, uh, <laughs> So that's it. <laughs> no, but, uh, but uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of happened all over the world anyway. I mean, we still have war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it'll be worse in Google Wave when you're talking live with someone who's mm -hmm. talking to you in a different language, and you're doing more than just talking to them, but you're collaborating concurrently on applications and stuff. Okay. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, well I, I made a big mistake of realizing that I didn't bring my business cards, but uh, my Harvard has business cards, so you know, I get a